if you want to, um, we, we can hear you from home, so if you want to chime in at any point, you, you can take, take, um, put your microphone on and uh, chat. Um, also, I think they can say something and they can hear. Even exactly. Can so hear if you us. want to speak at home, we can hear you in the room. That's no problem. Um, also, if you want to put something in the chat, um, I'll be monitoring it as well. And of course, we'll have questions at the end. Um, so thanks again. Thank you for giving us the talk and um, looking forward to hearing it. Thank you so much. Um, so is it a 50 minutes, uh, 50 minutes plus yeah, question yeah, sort of thing? Right okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and uh, an invitation to uh, to speak um, in front of the uh, our colleagues. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, basically three problems and one method. Uh, the uh, uh, the idea is that I, I, so for many problems I've worked on, uh, several problems I have worked on recently, I find some commonalities among these questions. Uh, uh, which are uh, basically counting the rare events. And for these uh, questions, uh, we can solve them by um, proving Poisson convergence theorem or Poisson approximation results. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to show you how these problems can be solved by a Poisson approximation method, which is called Stein's method. Um, so it is um, uh, based on several papers with, um, um, with, uh, with the three collaborators, uh, Louis Chen from uh, University, uh, National University of Singapore. Uh, this is probably uh, uh, Professor Chen uh, five years ago. Um, this is uh, Arturo Jaramillo, uh, my friend from uh, uh, CMAT. And this is uh, probably Arturo five years ago. Uh, I don't find a recent a photo. Uh, and this, um, uh, uh, the last is uh, Matthew Penrose um, uh, uh, from the University of Bath. And this is uh, uh, Matthew 15 years ago. All right, uh, so uh, let's get to the, the business. Uh, so we have a bunch of theorems, but I would like to tell you uh, the story first. So I'm gonna tell you about the first problem, um, which is, about uh, threshold. So uh, we are given um, ID, um, let's say, we are given ID samples from a sample uh, from a distribution on a set subset of RD. So uh, the goal is to infer some, uh, some knowledge, infer the set A uh, from this sample, from the sample XN. Uh, viewed as a point process. Uh, for instance, we are interested in the topology of the of A or uh, geometric properties of A. Um, so uh, it's very often this is there's a method uh, which amounts to consider uh, the the parametrized uh, the sets the union sets of these um, of the samples. So you draw a ball centered at the, um, the points xi of radius r, you take the union of it for all the i, for all the balls, and you call this set z in r. And the uh, parameterized by r, um, we are going to ask ourselves the following question. So given uh, rn, which is a sequence going to, going to zero, um, uh, when do we have, so the question is when do we have the probability of Z and Rn is connected. So we're interested in the event that Z and Rn uh, connected is going to what? Um, so why do we care about this, this question? Uh, so first of all, uh, there are, so why do we care? Uh, so first of all, there, it, it is a, a so knowing uh, that such an event happens with probability one is very important in the design of spectral clustering, for instance. So these are uh, famous clustering uh, algorithms in statistics and computer science, uh, where uh, typically you're going to build a connected graph from the data set, and then you try to uh, compute the, um, the eigenfunction uh, and do uh, clustering from there. 
So uh, as part of the deal, you have to construct a connected graph. So it's, it's important to know when uh, you're set. Okay, so you can view this. You can view the a graph from this set, which is the geometric graph. Uh, it's important to know that this graph, equivalent to the set, is connected. Also, uh, so having a limit uh, result of this type is useful to test, uh, for instance, the connectivity of the domain A. Uh, so uh, it is quite a useful concept. So it is um, our uh, motivation to study limiting behavior of uh, this kind of event. So now I can define what the so-called threshold is. A threshold value, so this is the first uh, keyword in my, in my title. Um, the, a threshold value is the value such that this event occurs Um, converges to some star which is in between zero and one. So uh, the idea is that uh, if we choose the right quantity Rn, if we choose the right quantity Rn, so we are going to converge to a non-trivial constant in between zero and one. If it is uh, uh, if it is much smaller, if it is smaller, then goes to zero. If it's uh, uh, if it is larger, then it goes to one. So we are interested in pinpointing the sequence R n such that this event converges to a constant, a non-trivial constant. So that's why we call it a threshold. Uh, and uh, actually, finding threshold is equivalent of um, finding the, uh, the weak limit of the, um, so weak limit means convergence in distribution. Uh, uh, okay, in case uh, not everybody is familiar with the language. Uh, so weak limit for this quantity, infimum of R such that Z and R becomes connected. Okay, so it is a, the fact that Z and R is connected is an increasing event. So if we increase the value of R, it becomes more and more connected. So we want to find the smallest value such that this thing is true. And we call it, it is a random variable now, and uh, I, I call it MN. All right, it is equivalent of, of doing this. And uh, actually I'm going to call MN twice of this value. Of course, it doesn't change anything. And there's a good reason why I multiply this quantity by two. I'm going to talk about it a bit later. But before doing that, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, to point out the fact that this event uh, ZNRN is connected is equal to the MN over two is bounded by RN. Okay, so just as the direct translation uh, from how we define this MN. So it is exactly the same thing. So if we, if we can prove a weak limit result for MN, then uh, we have knowledge about this uh, limiting probability. Okay. Um, so, so the claim is this. Yeah. Uh, so a, a set is connected uh, if uh, for any two point you can find a path belonging to the set, which connect the continuous path belong to the path which connect these two points. So now it's just a set. I, I haven't talked about graph uh, uh, yet. So uh, this this is a random set because the center of the uh, so the idea is that you have all the uh, so in R2, you have these points, you're going to draw balls centered around this, uh, this thing, uh, these, these points. And uh, so this is uh, the union, the union set now uh, is, is not connected because you, you, know, you, you, don't, uh, you don't have a pulse connecting these two, these two points. Wait, this is unitary. This, uh, yeah, we consider union. No, no, R, R, R. Radius R is parameterized by R. Yeah, you have a family of uh, of uh, of sets. R is the same for all. R is the same for all the balls. Yeah, and then we vary R. 
and we want to see the change of behavior, topological behavior of this set. At some, so at some point, every ball is extremely large so that you have a connected thing, right? So you have to, this has to happen some, um, at some point. All right, I, I hope, uh, okay, well, definition is clear now. Uh, so important claim is this. Um, so the claim is that MN defined as the connectivity threshold is equal to the supremum of the edge lens of a minimal spanning tree on my uh, point process XN or the set of points, the data set. Okay, so what is a minimal spanning tree? So I just need to introduce one more definition. Um, MST on a set of points is uh, the connected graph spanning XN. So the vertex set is equal to XN, and the, uh, and uh, and the edge is chosen in such a way that it minimize. minimizes the total length. Okay, so one example. Uh, so uh, let's say I have, a, I have a bunch of points on the, on the plane, uh, something like this. Uh, so there's a, there are algorithms which are uh, um, available for me to, to build a trace. So basically uh, the, um, you know, like this, so the basic idea is to choose the, the closest pair and starting from there, grow the graph in such a way that every time we add an edge to it, uh, it is the closest point to the existing graph. And this is uh, actually the uh, classical uh, greedy algorithm for building a minimal spanning tree. Uh, so this is a, eventually will be a tree. Although we require it to be a connected to graph, uh, since we wanted to minimize the total length, it has to be a tree. And uh, uh, the, um, the algorithm, the way we build this graph implies that minimal spanning tree has minimum, minimax, minimax pass. In the sense that uh, every pass in the tree, every pass in the tree must satisfy the property that it minimizes the maximal length, the maximal edge length on the pass. Yes. Uh, are there any constraints on uh, the set A that you defined at the, at the beginning? Because one could imagine if, if these points are somewhere near the boundary of A. Yeah, uh, we, this yeah we assume, uh, uh, okay, I didn't see anything Excuse about me. it. So Excuse I, me. If you yeah. could please repeat the question so that ah, yeah. the audio and then Yeah, it. yeah. So you go ask it about the, uh, the condition I put on the set A, the, uh, where I sample my points. I assume this this uh, the set is a smooth has smooth boundary. Uh, it's a uh, it's a compact uh, subset, a uh, compact uh, uh, set with smooth boundary in order B. Uh, but what if any straight path between two points uh, crosses that boundary? I, I do not assume convexity. Uh, so as for now, it's just uh, just uh, a seat with a set with C2 boundary um, and um, so, so it's uh, okay so sorry to press the point it's fine if 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 a ball uh, actually crosses the boundary of the set uh, the boundary of the set a the particular ball is uh, so it could it could when, 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 it it is, the when the point is near side. the boundary it could yeah okay in, indeed it could uh, the ball will be uh, intersecting the the complement of a uh, that, well, that that happens, of course. Uh, a, any fixed R, if the points is closer uh, to the boundary uh, within distance smaller than R, then yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So so here, uh, I think the, the important thing I, will, I really want to emphasize is that uh, so on the on one hand you have a, a connectivity threshold, it's just topological threshold. On the other hand, you have a, a spatial uh, network, which is the minimal spanning tree 
spanning all the data points. And um, uh, I would like to give a proof of this, actually. Uh, this will require my, uh, me explaining um, a lot of things. Uh, so maybe I, I'm going to skip this part. So I'm going to just to say uh, the um, Hmm. So, okay, so I, I'm only just, just gonna tell you that this, um, uh, the pause, the minimal spanning tree, any pause in the minimal spanning tree will satisfy the minimax property. And this property means that uh, the, uh, the pause minimize the maximum length of any pause, uh, maximum length of any, uh, any pause connecting these two points. For instance, here is a pause in the minimal spanning tree. It is the minimal one in the sense that the maximum length on this pause, which is this one, is smaller than any other pause connecting these two, uh, the, edge, the maximum edge length on the pause connecting these two points. So this is in particular smaller than this one. And from here, we have a characterization of the edge of the minimal spanning tree. So an edge, E belongs to an edge in the um, an edge belongs to the minimal spanning tree. Uh, if and only if if I take a Boolean model, I take this uh, union of sets. If and only if I uh, I take the Boolean sets, these two points belong to two different components necessarily because of the minimax property. So uh, that's why you have this this connection here. So. The component of the connectivity threshold is equal to connectivity threshold. Twice of that is equal to the longest edge of the minimal spanning tree. All right. So far, so good, hopefully. Um, so I will not prove this, but uh, anyway, so the, the, the point is that we can now have a link of this, make a link between the connectivity threshold. with the event that, so this guy is equal to the maximum length, the, ma the longest edge of the minimal spanning trees. So on the right-hand side, I'm going to say that since the longest edge is smaller than Rn, all the edges are smaller than 2Rn. So, which means that there exists no edge in the minimal spanning tree, which is with, whose length is larger than 2Rn. So you have a random variable equals to zero, and this quantity will be very close to exponential negative alpha, if, it's a big if here, if we can show that the sum, so the counting for this kind of rare event is somehow close in total variation in some distance, with a possible random variable with parameter alpha. So if we can show the possible convergence, right? So we can replace this guy by a possible random variable with parameter alpha, and that one equals to zero have, occurs with probability e to the negative alpha. So this is the basic idea. And uh, alpha will be the expected, the limit of the expectation. So I'm just here, I say that presumably I can show this for some alpha, there exists alpha, oh, okay. finite. Such that I, I can show this, then I have a result for the connectivity threshold. And this is what we show in uh, the first, uh, in this, in here. So uh, it is a joint work with, uh, with Matthew Penrose. Uh, the, um, the result says that if you consider properly normalize your uh, this is the right scaling in dimension two for the connectivity threshold. And this thing will converge to the, the, the probability of connectivity converges to this quantity here. And we also have a rate of convergence uh, for the, um, yeah, for how close these two, these two quantities are. Okay, so this is based on possible convergence with explicit error bounds. Uh, in three dimension or higher, 
the scaling is different. You see that here, all you need is a log term. You have this n times pi is the uh, actually the, the the area of the unit ball, and m uh, m n is the connectivity threshold, and two is the dimension. So in general, you have the same little quantity here, but you need a different correction term. You have a log log term. So log two is my notation for uh, for log log. Yeah. All right. So here also you have this log log term divided by log n, and that's the rate. Okay. So let's get back to. So this just give you an idea how useful a Poisson convergence could be. Oh, up to rules. Brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, another threshold after all. Uh, so uh, this is going to be uh, uh, the second problem. Let's go back to the, uh, so bear with me, I will get to the point. Uh, so problem number two is about coverage. So this time I'm going to define, um, What's okay. the intuition for the difference in the numerology between D2 and greater than 2? Okay. Very good question, Lashi. Uh, so the point is here that uh, the, where is it? Here. So I want to emphasize this. I have highlighted this A here and this, uh, this partial A. Partial A means the boundary of A. So it turns out that uh, what matters in dimension two is that uh, the point that is the most isolated point in dimension two appears in the interior of the set A. And the most isolated point in dimension three and higher appears to uh, occur, uh, tend to be on the boundary of A. So uh, that's why you have a different you kind of have to handle this complicated uh, boundary effect in dimension three and higher. Okay, cool. Yes, let's get to the um, other business. <coughs> um, so uh, second question, second uh, problem. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about coverage, uh, coverage problem. So this time uh, the question is, can I find a sequence Rn the same question, it's kind of sequence Rn such as Zn Rn include, um, contain a convergence to a non-trivial constant. And, and this is equivalent of, okay, by pure analogy, you can see that this is equivalent to, to, the, um, to finding a, uh, a weak limit for Rn, now it is the connectivity threshold. So sorry, this is called a, a coverage stress. Okay, so uh, here's the claim. The claim is that uh, Rn is equal to, again, I'm going to make a link between this threshold with a certain uh, spatial network. So this time it will be the maximal radius of the um, of the Voronoi cells uh, generated by the XIs. So how do I define it? Just um, uh, one second. Uh, R is the smallest R such that the CXI belongs to VR of XI. Okay, so definition. Of course, I need to define what is a Voronoi, uh, Voronoi tessellation. And that is a partition That is a partition of A given by the union of CI, sorry, CXI. And these CXIs are called Voronoi cells. And those are the points in A such that Y is closer to XI than any other points. So just to give you an illustration, so we have a, uh, a domain, we have a bunch of points, 
Uh, and then the Voronoi tessellation will be uh, something like this. And the idea is that now this, connect, this coverage threshold is equal to the largest cell I can find, basically. And here is the definition, right? So I want to find the smallest radius R such that CXI included in this cell. So maybe it's uh, probably this one. This is the hardest to cover, I would say. So this is the, the one that maximizes this, uh, uh, this radius. OK. And why is that? Uh, so if I take a value, if I take a value larger than this, uh, this boy I just draw, then necessarily, so this is pretty straightforward. So if I take R, which is larger than the right-hand side, then what, has, what happens is that uh, the, since by definition, this belongs to BR of XI, if I take the union for all the I from N, I have a union. On the other hand, this is a this is a partition, so you do have a coverage. So A is covered by the union of these sets. Okay, so this gives you one side, but the other side can be proved similarly. So that's why now I'm going to make use of this fact and uh, the connection between a, a coverage threshold and a um, um, and the, um, again, so I'm um, some sort of characteristic of spatial network generated. This time spatial network is the edges of the, of the Voronoi cells. Okay, uh, so again, the same story. Uh, I can make the link between Rn, smaller than or equal to Rn, little Rn. And this time this will be the sum of indicators R of XI. So this will be the, uh, the smallest radius. I'm going to call this guy RI. So R of XI is larger than RN. So none of the, the radius will satisfy this property. After doing this translation, it is again reduced to a possible approximation problem. So here's what we got. Okay, so, uh, so we consider more general cases where this K indicates the fact that, um, so we are interested in the K, connect, K coverage threshold, means that we want to find the smallest R such that every point is covered K times. So when K is equal to one, you have the Rn I just defined. So in the more general case, still you have the distinction between dimension two and the higher dimension. In dimension two, you're going to see that the most difficult, the, the point is furthest to any, everybody else, the point that is the hardest to cover appears to be in the, in the middle or the boundary in dimension two. And in higher dimension, only boundary uh, matters. Okay, so this is another example of uh, how useful this kind of thing can be. Okay, uh, it appears that I still have some time. I was, I was confused. I thought it would have to finish. Uh, I still have 20 or something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, can I uh, yeah. ask a question? Look, how uh, stable are the results with respect to any possible correlations among the points? So you assume from the, from the very beginning, the points are IAT. Exactly. So, uh, so they're endpoints. Suppose they have weak correlations, so more than one over N. So mm -hmm. Would the results be still be stable with respect to that? We, we have uh, no result at all <laughs> in any kind of, sorry. Yeah, I would, I would like to uh, repeat uh, Igor's question. So Igor asked uh, whether or not these results are stable if I uh, sort of uh, add some correlation among these points. And uh, we don't know. Uh, so for now, all the results are based on either a Poisson point process, uh, which is not far from being IID, uh, actually a, even a better case than IID, uh, has some spatial, um, spatial independence. Uh, so it'll be um, 
um, this, this is kind of the question I will ask at the end of the talk. So, uh, so what can, can one do about uh, extreme statistics for uh, points which are correlated? I think maybe you, you might have some different, it could be in different universality class, right? So I don't know. So I don't have an answer for that. Sorry, <laughs> can I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, what happens if your A uh, is essentially the full space RD, but the distribution is more or less localized with some uh, uh, fuzzy decaying tails? So in that, sense, in that case, there will not be uh, a clearly defined boundary as you as you yeah, here, yeah. but still uh, something similar should obtain. Do, do you have any? It, yeah, it's uh, again the question uh, from Igor is that the uh, uh, what if I choose a um, what if I choose a uh, a distribution uh, which is supported on the RD, and uh, for instance. Uh, uh, there, there are there there are exist there exist results in the, in uh, in very special cases. Uh, there's a, a Matthew has a paper on uh, the Gaussian densities. So if you uh, sample your points according to a, a, a standard Gaussian random variable, every, every point is standard Gaussian. It has a completely different uh, scaling. Uh, so this kind of thing will not be true. So there will be a lot of logs uh, because of the uh, well. It's, it's a different situation, okay, but you. yeah, it's a good question. Um, you, uh, but I, I don't believe there are general results for for more general family of of, of density uh, distribution. Uh, there are there is a there, I think there is a result about in only in dimension two about elliptic uh, elliptically uh, contoured distributions. Uh, I don't remember the author, but there is something like that, uh, but not uh, more general than that. Okay, I want to mention one last problem before I go to the uh, uh, the method part. There are too many, maybe it's already a lot of uh, problems, but still, I want to show you um, the problems. There are more problems we can solve with the same kind of uh, idea. And the third question, the third part will be about uh, arithmetic functions. Uh, so now we consider this W omega k, which is which counts the number of divisors prime divisors, P divide K. Other words we can write as a sum of indicators. Okay, so the first question is that, can we find the average of, the, uh, of, the, of this omega function? This is just no probability for now, right? So what is average? Average is just you take the sum of this, uh, this omega K from one to N and the, uh, just the sample average. And it, a, um, it, it turns out that this, uh, this behaves like a log log n. And, um, um, and once you know the average of this function is log log n, you would like to know what is the variance of it, right? It's so sort of the variance or the fluctuation. And that could be defined as this. So let me try to compute omega of k minus log log n. I know this is the average, so I'm going to subtract the average. I'm going to take square of it, so just a sample variance. And this turns out to be log log n as well. OK, so what is, uh, what is the deal? Why am I mentioning this? There's no probability. Uh, I'm mentioning this because we can make it a probabilistic question. Because if I let Jn be uniformly distributed in the set 1 to n, so it takes the value k with probability one over n. Then we immediately see that the average, the so-called average, is equal to the expected value of omega of jn, just by the definition of jn. And the so-called variance is equal to the second moment of jn minus log log n squared. All right. Uh, so we can actually do more general than this. Uh, so we can actually claim the following. We can claim that k smaller than or equal to n, if I count the number of k's such that this property is satisfied, 
if I count the number of k satisfied the property is satisfied, actually 95% of this k will satisfy this property. So the fluctuation, the correct fluctuation of w of omega from log log n is square root of log log n, essentially. So this will be approximately 0.95 n. So where did I get this number 0.95? It is uh, so everybody in statistics knows that uh, normal random variable uh, is bounded by two with probably 95%. So, this actually, there is a central limit theorem behind it. So, uh, the classical result by Hardy Ramnujan uh, says that if you normalize your log log n, so in probabilistic language, it converges to uh, it converges to one. And Eldersh Katz gave the central limit theorem, which says that if you normalize log log n, uh, omega of j n by log log n, then divided by square root of log log n, it converges to standard normal random variable. And that's why we can find this thing by Trans making the translation to probability. And uh, how come uh, we can prove this? And, and there is also a possible limit result behind it. And this result is uh, with Chen, um, Jeremy uh, just last year. So we have proved that JN and probability and the Poisson random variable omega of Jn is close to Poisson with this rate. And this rate is optimal. All right. Kevin, do you raise the hand? Raise hand. Okay. Kevin, please go ahead. We can hear you. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I, I didn't go to the uh, room because I, I just finished another meeting. I, 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 I know what you're doing here. I just say, because you use central limit, okay, you uh, check the conversion of the uh, mean or burns. So that's, 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 I know, uh, I know the reason behind. I just want to one question. Do you provide any indication of the rate of conversion to a normal limit? To normal? Yeah. Yes, yes. This actually, this actually, uh, this result here uh, implies implies the the um, a central limit theorem. So we, if we standardize it by log two n using my dictation from previous slide, uh, n zero one will be bounded by one over sorry c over okay. root of log log n. Okay. This implies this simply because you can approximate Poisson random variable by a normal with this yeah. variable. But the, the, this result is more useful for me, more my interesting. My question is, does this this rate, this converging rate is optimal one? Is yeah, this, this is the optimal? Yeah. yeah, this one is optimal. Oh. This one is optimal because you can find, so there's a proof by... Um, yeah. Back. Uh, prove the lower bound of this order. So, uh, so you know, it's an upper and lower bound of same order. It's tight. Right. You can prove it's optimal. So that, that's useful. Yeah. That's uh, for me. Yeah. It's uh, very useful. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Maybe I in some time time I'll talk to you later. Sorry to disturb you. Okay. Thank you. No worries. It's uh, good to have questions. Thank you for the question. Um, so this is not actually not new result. I'm just one word. It's not a new result. It is obtained by Reed and Turin. Um, this is just the central limit theorem uh, with optimal rate. It's obtained by Reed and Turin with analytic proof using complex analysis. So we have a pure probabilistic proof by possible approximation. All right, so I'm going to get to the point where, so I wanna show you the commonality uh, behind everything. So I, I, I will have not much time, but I hope I can at least convey the idea. And, uh, and that is the, uh, the Stein's method, which is very useful for proving possible approximation. Okay, uh, so Stein's method for, uh, is uh, devised by 
Charles Stein in the 1970s, beginning of 1970s, uh, for normal approximation. And then uh, in 1975, uh, Professor Chen, uh, who's here actually in the, in the Zoom call, very happy to have him uh, in the call. Uh, so he generalized Stein's idea and really pushed this method much, much further than uh, what Stein initially did. Uh, so, so now there are a lot of distribution, distribution approximation which can be obtained by the so-called Stein's method. Uh, and uh, the Poisson case was done by Chen. So nowadays it's also called the Chen Stein method. Uh, so there's a monograph in this Chen Stein method for Poisson approximation. This, this very good, a very nice book, plenty of nice examples, which was done by Barbara Holst and Jensen in the beginning of the 90s. And all stories starts with the key identity. Uh, so X is a Poisson distribution with parameter alpha, if and only if I can show the distributional identity. If alpha f of X plus one, if this kind of identity holds for a large, sufficient large class of F. For instance, F bounded. And the heuristic of, of um, uh, so I'm gonna, not going to show this because this is basically um, submission by parts. Um, many, many, uh, many methods can, can, can be used to, to show this kind of thing. But the, once we observe this identity, the heuristic is that uh, if you can show if can show um, some random variable y, which is different from x, right? X is, uh, is Poisson. If we can have this kind of uh, uh, approximate value for, uh, so we don't have identity, that's fine. If we can show this kind of approximate identity for a sufficient large class of functions, then this random variable has to be close, then y has to be close to Poisson alpha, right? Because uh, you have identity for Poisson alpha. So uh, in order to make sense of it, uh, the uh, Stein Chen uh, uh, devised the following equation. So we are going to consider x f x f of x equals to h of x minus h of Poisson random variable. Um, so this is just the uh, integration of h with respect to the, the Poisson random variable, the law of the Poisson random variable. Uh, why this kind of equation is useful? Uh, so this is the input. h is the input, and we solve for f. Uh, the point is that if we plug in y for both sides, plug in y for both sides and take the expectation. And what we see is that the right-hand side, if I take a supremum of, over a large class of uh, function h, then I have a notion of a distance between the two random variables. For instance, if I take h to be the indicator of a subset of z, then, um, if I take the supremum of the right-hand side, then we have the total variation of distance. Okay, so now we see that the total variation of distance will be equal to the supremum of, of all the f of h. f will be the solution with respect to a given h, f h. Um, so for all the h, written in this way, right? So we're going to compute, instead of uh, looking at this quantity, which is uh, not very tractable, not very tractable in looking this way, we're going to look at the random variable itself and consider the discrepancy between these two values.
And this is uh, what we got. And now uh, it becomes clear that if I have a good bounds for Stein's equation, so before I take any expectation, if I good bounds for that, for instance, uh, uh, then if I good bounds, then I have a good, uh, I can sort of manipulate the right-hand side and have a good bound uh, for the total variation. And this is done by uh, the following lemma, um, proved by Chen and uh, another paper, uh, Barbo, um, which says that, if H is indicator of A, then F of H satisfy the following uniform bound. Okay, so this is particularly useful when alpha is large. When alpha is large, you have a very small, uh, small number for Uh, you have a very small factor uh, for the um, uh, for the supremum norm of f, and this one is the difference operator. So f of x is defined to be f of x plus one minus f of x. Just notation. And these two things are very important uh, because then. Uh, my next thing will be to give you a general bound by Stein's method for the total variation of distance between a general random variable and a Poisson random variable, and we end there. So the theorem is the following. Uh, so the theorem was already in Stein's 86 monograph. Well, at least ideas, part of the ideas there. Uh, and also in this, this book, by uh, Barbo, Ost, and Jensen, 92. Uh, this is a coupling approach. So assume that we can find a coupling of Y and Y star such that, which is, um, we can find a coupling uh, on the same probability space such that, okay, I will not say anything. Uh, Assume you can find a coupling. There exists a coupling. Then the total variational distance between Y and um, a Poisson random variable with parameter alpha. Um, so here this alpha will be taken to be the expected value of Y. So we're comparing two random variables with the same mean. Um, and this will be bounded by, um, so here's the, the general thing. So one over one over alpha times alpha expected value of y minus y star. If you can find a coupling of your random variable y, for instance, the counting, uh, the sum of indicators I did in the three problems, you can find a coupling such that uh, your y, uh, you can find a, a, a y star, constructed y star, which is not very far from, uh, from y. Okay, so I forgot to mention one thing, it's very bad. <laughs> is this a coupling such that uh, y f of y is equal to alpha f of y star plus one? If you have this, then the distance will be bounded essentially by the distance between your y and your y star. If you have a very good coupling, the distance is small, then your total version distance will be small. All right. Uh, I think I've used up the, uh, the 50 minutes. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just stop here. If you have any question, uh, if you, well, you could ask. Thanks for listening. Well, Lashi, I think Lashi, uh, raise your hand. Okay, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you um, tell me what, where the, um, a very nice talk, by the way. Um, 
Can you can you just tell me what where does the smoothness assumption on the boundary come in? What if what if you have something like Lipschitz boundary? Um, the um, regularity assumption uh, that's because we I think if if we um, we can, I can assume just Lipschitz if I don't want a result as precise as the one I presented. So we, we do need it in the, um, because I need to do the Taylor expansion of order two uh, near the boundary uh, wow. for, the, uh, for, the, for the case of uh, uh, weak limit. But for case of a law of large numbers in the sense that if I just want to show that MN, um, I have this, right? And D, M into the D. I know that normalized by log n, maybe some other constant, C1, C2, log log n, converges to a random variable, which is a gumball random variable. So that's the result I have uh, in previous slide. If I don't want this as, as much as precise as this one, so this is not the, the log large term, this is the weak limit result. Mm -hmm. if you just want LLN in the sense that n theta D, M, n to the D divided by C1 log n goes to one, I don't need C2 boundary, I need C1. So I can reduce the regularity of the boundary. Um, well, if I want a less precise result. Um, so technically, I need a Taylor expansion of order two. OK, thank you. More questions? <laughs> I have a question, sorry. Um, can you continue the Taylor expansion and get more terms? Yeah, uh, we, we are already uh, having uh, the weak limit. Uh, so that's sort of, uh, uh, it's, it's complete somehow. Uh, so assuming more regularity will not give more results, more new results. So C2 is sufficient. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Can you, can you talk more about the spanning tree? So you, you, you brought up the spanning tree and then I kind of lost where you, where you went. Okay, yeah, I just mentioned that you can do the translation between MN and uh, where is this menu tree here? Um, between your MN and so you have a sum of indicators again, it's uh, it was the case where we expect to see a Poisson behavior if, uh, if this thing, uh, if the occurrence of such an event is, uh, is, uh, is rare. Um, so I make the link between this one between the connectivity threshold with um, a discrete problem, sort of, you can just look at all the edges of the most spanning tree. And does it, do you get a similar result for the, the second thing? Uh, I, have, I have the same similar thing. Yeah, that one, I need a different uh, network. So this time the network will be uh, a war noise, war noise tessellation. So I have a similar identity like, uh, like this one um, here, right? So I want to understand the coverage threshold uh, and uh, I can translate this to the war noise. This is the size of each war noise cell, essentially. So the size, no, none of the, cell, the cells are larger than Rn. That, um, that's uh, how I do the translation from threshold to uh, network. All right, so I just realized I didn't answer the question from Arturo uh, about the uh, other uh, topological behavior from, uh, from this thresholds. And there is a very nice paper by, uh, I think, Smell, um, Yugi, and, uh, and Weinberger. Um, okay, sorry, I don't, I'm not able to, to, to spell correctly the names. Uh, so they say that if, if you take your Rn 
which is smaller than some constant, which depends only on D and the set, uh, probably curvature as well. Um, and the um, and it's larger than the Rn, the, the coverage threshold, uh, then your set N Rn is uh, has the same homology uh, to um, as the uh, as your set A. So you can indeed use coverage threshold to make inference about the, um, the topology of the underlying underlying set. Right, this is just a comment to uh, to one of the previous questions. I'll I'll ask one more if it's if it's not too much. Yeah, go ahead. So um, it's very interesting that there's a lot of topological information being recovered, but in some sense, I mean, the interior of your set is flat. So if you have some curvature, so maybe you, you're not on, um, you know, a, a, a subset of RN, you're, I don't know, on some other set where, I mean, you could be on a, on a, on a surface or a submanifold or whatever, yeah. if you like. Uh, where now you have constraints. I mean, just looking at what you wrote, it doesn't seem to me that you, you would just be able to replace the arguments with geodesics. It should be that, you know, you're getting these log log terms and so on and so forth. So I would anticipate that somehow the geometry would make contributions at least to the numerics that you're getting there, the numerology of these, of these numbers. Yeah, we, we actually have, a, maybe I didn't uh, say it uh, loud. Uh, so the result actually works for, um, so the second of the first result. Coverage threshold is, uh, we consider uh, the, um, uh, the case of manifold, uh, a compact manifold with, uh, with boundary. Uh, and D is the dimension of the, of the manifold. Uh, so at least for the leading statistics, we don't see curvature. Uh, so because it's RN actually goes to zero and uh, uh, locally the ball, uh, geodesic ball and, and um including ball the same at the same volume uh, sure volume. That, that's really interesting though that that somehow so this is really a topological result then yeah yeah it is very much uh, in the vein of so-called topological data analysis so uh, okay okay thank you I have one more question, just since it's your introductory talk. Yeah. So I'm reading your website, and it says, Coral Energy Theory and its connection with analysis statistics and other disciplines of science technology, such as physics, machine learning, geometric and topological data analysis. So can, can you talk about sort of applications? Or, or is, it, is it this work that's connected to sort of machine learning or something like that? Or is it yeah. Is yeah. just another work? Uh, yes, definitely. I'm very much interested in uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, theoretical aspects of this, basically. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, in here, for instance, this connectivity threshold has application uh, in spectral clustering. Uh, so there are methods uh, where you, you have a data set and then you first construct a graph, uh, construct a, a geometric graph, which you connect two points very closely enough. And, uh, and this, uh, uh, the graph is just a zero dimensional skeleton of of the set uh, so you want to have a connected graph then you need to know how large the radius should be taken and this radius should be according to the result uh, uh, log n a constant log n divided by n to the one over d if the c is large enough then uh, you ensure connectivity from, from this, uh, uh, the thing here, right? So we find, we pinpoint the, the connectivity threshold as satisfying this property. Uh, so if you're, you see that you have a log divided by N, then one over D, that will ensure, if this constant is large enough, they will ensure that this guy goes to, uh, the probability of connectivity goes to one. Uh, so that could, give you a, a guide of uh, how to choose your RN in order that you have a connected graph. Uh, yeah, I'm eager to learn more on this. I really don't know much, uh, but uh, I, I see already some applications. 
Stop recording, maybe? Yes. Uh, thank you guys for attending. I will stop recording and maybe stop the meeting as well. Thank you.